Chapter 5 is all about viruses. So let's jump into what virus, what being a virus really means compared to being a cell. Um, and first I want to point out that viruses have really shaped evolution. They um, have infected plants, animals, bacteria, and really shaped the genome of those structures. So it's estimated that up to 10% of our own human genome is actually genome uh, genetic material inserted by viruses. Um, more than that, probably 20% of bacterial DNA is really viral sequences. The reason that um, viruses are not considered living things is because we call them obligate intracellular parasites. They cannot divide, they cannot reproduce, they cannot make new virus outside of another cell. They must invade a, specific, uh, a host cell and use that cell's machinery to make new virus. Every type of living thing on the planet that we know of uh, is infected by certain types of viruses. It might surprise you and maybe even scare you to know that every milliliter of seawater probably contains a hundred million viruses. Now, the reassuring thing is that uh, most of those viruses cannot do anything to humans. They can only infect bacteria for the most part. But um, there's just, there's virus everywhere. Um, the term virus is poison in Latin and was, um, we, before we could see these viruses, before we had the technology to see something so small, scientists had long postulated that there was something smaller than bacteria, something beyond the reach of light microscopy that could cause diseases because we were noticing diseases without being able to culture um, culture microbes in the typical sense with blood auger plates and what have you um, from those infected organisms. So what does it mean to be a virus? Well, every virus is infectious, meaning that it is an obligate intracellular parasite. The only way it can continue its life cycle is to infect a host cell and um, make that host cell do its bidding. The host must take care of every need of a virus. It produces ATP, it provides the machinery to make new proteins and new genetic materials. And every virus has its own genes, usually only a, a couple, a handful of genes, very simplistic genome. That genome can be either DNA or RNA. It's never both. It's, all, it's one or the other. And the structure of a virus is very, very simple. So it takes very few genes to, um, to in the genome for a virus to work. Sometimes it's only one or two genes. Viruses are very small. So here we see a comparison. This huge, huge cell here is actually a yeast cell, much smaller than most of our cells. Here's an E. coli and a streptococcus bacterium. Uh, for comparison's sake, there are a few viruses that we've discovered quite recently that are large enough that they're actually larger than the smallest bacteria. But most, of, most viruses are way down here on this end, much, much smaller than a bacterial cell. And therefore, we can only see them through electron microscopy. It's very important for testing purposes that you know the structure of viruses. Um, and it's much, much simpler than the structure of any living cells. In fact, I'm going to jump to the next slide here. There's only a couple major parts. There's a capsid which is the protein shell around, around the outside of the virus. And in some viruses, that's it. There's a capsid with genetic material inside, and that's the whole virus. Some viruses are, we call them naked, do not have uh, any cell membrane outside of that capsid. Enveloped viruses, we'll see a picture of that in a second, have a capsid and a a remnant of cell membrane that it got from its host. Uh, viruses must have spike proteins on the outside. Spike proteins are present to allow uh, 
viruses to adhere to their host cells. And then the term virion is what we call the entire assembled virus. That includes the capsid, spikes, genetic material, and if, if it's an envelope virus, the cell membrane piece as well. So here are some diagrams. Here on, on the left side of the screen is a naked virus. It has a short piece of genetic material on the inside. It's the purple. It's got protein material on the outside. That's the capsid. And then it's got coming out of it spike proteins. So spike proteins allow it to bind to host cells. Um, here are uh, two different shapes of a naked virus. This polygonal structure here called an icosahedral virus and uh, this tubular one called a helical virus. On the right side of the screen we have enveloped viruses which are similar except that outside of the capsid they've got a remnant of cell membrane. They didn't make it. Remember viruses don't make anything. They just steal. Uh, this is stolen cell membrane from the host cell that made this virus. And then spike proteins on the outside. And we see that envelope viruses can come as icosahedral shapes or as helical shapes. Whether or not a virus is enveloped makes a big difference for how we can prevent and treat it. Envelope viruses are known for being susceptible to hand sanitizer, for example, but naked viruses are not damaged by alcohol-based hand sanitizers. So this should um, hopefully help remind you that just using hand sanitizer is not enough in a healthcare setting to keep your hands clean. You really need soap and water. So we can separate or group or identify bacteria uh, viruses, sorry, as um, by their shape, as helical viruses or as um, icosahedral viruses. Icosahedron, remember, is the polygon shape. Or as complex viruses, this is a typical bacteriophage shape. It contains an icosahedral, a helical, and some legs. It kind of looks like a spider. So we can categorize by shape. We can categorize, based on your previous slide, by whether a virus is naked or enveloped. Um, and we can also categorize based on the, the, vir the virus's host range and tissue tropism. These are two important terms. Host range means the type of host or hosts that a virus can infect. Some viruses, for example, like rabies, can infect just about any mammal. Some viruses like hepatitis, or certain types of hepatitis, can only infect humans. That's the host range. So in some viruses, it's very, very narrow. And in some, it is a very wide range of hosts. In bacteriophages, which are viruses that only infect bacteria, their host range is limited to certain bacteria. Tissue tropism refers not to the type of animal, but to the tissue that they're capable of, of infecting. So a hepatitis virus is has its tissue tropism. It can only infect liver cells. Sometimes they can infect liver cells of multiple species, but the tissue tropism refers to what exact tissue versus the host range, which, if, which relates to what type of organism or what animal. The last way that we can describe viruses or group them is whether they are DNA or RNA viruses. And that refers to uh, the type of genetic material that the virus contains. Remember, they can be either DNA or RNA, but never both. So a DNA virus, when it injects its genetic material, is injecting either single-stranded or double-stranded DNA, and then utilizing the translate the transcription and translation uh, processes of the host cell to make its own genetic material and proteins. An RNA virus is skipping the DNA phase so it's injecting RNA. Often that RNA is ready to be translated into new protein right away or copied into new pieces of RNA for the genetic material of new variants. 
one unique type of RNA virus that you should know about is retrovirus. Retrovirus is a group of viruses that inject their RNA and then use a unique enzyme called reverse transcriptase to turn their RNA into DNA. It's the exact backwards flow that we expect in our cells. And that DNA is then incorporated into the host cell's DNA permanently. Uh, the HIV virus that causes AIDS is a great example. It's a retrovirus. It injects its RNA into our cells. And then reverse transcriptase turns RNA into DNA. And that HIV DNA is then inserted into the human genome. Here are some examples, some clinically relevant examples of types of virus. You do not need to memorize this at this point. We'll be learning about some of these viruses later on.